So, uh, as mentioned, I am going to talk about wisdom, and not just any wisdom, but the wisdom from above. That's uh, my topic, and that's what I am going to talk about. And the topic will be based on what Apostle James writes in the third chapter of his epistle in uh, verse 17. And in James 3.17 we read, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. That's the description of the wisdom from above that Apostle James uh, gives us. Uh, we will try to consider all the elements uh, mentioned here. Well, uh, why? If anybody would like to ask this question, because in order to understand what wisdom from above consists in, and to, to be to think whether we possess all these elements of wisdom in ourselves, because definitely wisdom from above is something that we would like to have. So. Uh, we should be able to understand the elements and to consider, to ponder within ourselves whether we possess these elements or maybe we lack these elements. Well, even if we do lack them, it's good to know because being aware of something is the first step towards changing the situation. It's the same as in ordinary health of our bodies. If you don't know that you are ill, you don't start any medical treatment. The first thing you need to understand, to be aware of, is that you are ill, then you can seek help, then you can try to get medical treatment to improve your health. And uh, the same is true as far as spiritual health is concerned. You must be aware that something is wrong to be able to try to improve it, to change it. So, uh, in case of wisdom, when we talk about uh, when it comes to wisdom, well, it's good uh, to know what we lack in it because it's the beginning of the process of getting it. So, uh, wisdom consists of three things. Faith, hope and knowledge. Uh, how do we know that? Well, Apostle Peter, in his famous edition in 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses uh, from 5 through 7, where he writes to faith and virtue and to virtue eight, and he mentions all these elements. There are eight of them, seven high, higher primary graces, and uh, uh, knowledge there, which is not a grace, but it is necessary there, because uh, Apostle Peter not only mentions seven primary graces here, he also mentions the four great attributes of God's character, one of which is wisdom. Okay, And wisdom consists of faith, hope and knowledge. And I would like to emphasize that knowledge itself does not make us wise. It is having faith, and hope in the knowledge, which means having hope and faith in God's truth that makes us wise. This knowledge is the basis of our hope for good things in the future as promised by our Lord. And to be really wise, you need to have all the three elements. It is uh, not enough to know God's truth. Why? And now I will, uh, as answer to this question, I will quote the definition that Brother Johnson gave us in the present uh, truth, where he wrote that wisdom is the tactful application of the divine truth which we know, understand, and trust to good ends for the glory of God. I will read it once again. Wisdom is the tactful application of the divine truth which we know, understand, and trust to good ends for the glory of God. This is wisdom. So, if you are knowledgeable, it doesn't mean you are wise. If you apply this knowledge which you have to good ends and for the glory of God, only then you are wise. That follows from this definition. Wisdom from above is not 
a theoretical thing. It must be put into practice, otherwise it is not wisdom at all. Uh, I would uh, say even that it's, um, if you don't apply this wisdom, if you don't put it in practice, it would be better for you to be ignorant. Because not applying wisdom is, well, stupidity, to put it bluntly. It is stupidity and it would be better for you to be ignorant because if you know how to, what, how to do good and you don't do it, your situation is worse than the situation of the person who doesn't know how to do good and that's the reason why this person doesn't do good. You remember what our Lord said when he talked about two servants. There was one who didn't know his Lord's will and he didn't do it. Well, he deserved some punishment because if he were a better servant, he would know his Lord's will. But since he didn't know the Lord's will and he didn't do it because of that, he deserved only some punishment. But Jesus said that the servant who knew his Lord's will but didn't do it deserved great punishment because he was a willful sinner. The other one was not a willful sinner, and a willful <coughs> sinner is a worse sinner than the ignorant sinner, we could say. Well, even secure, I mean, secure, uh, secular law, uh, not religious law, but secure, I don't know, I got mixed up as far as pronunciation is concerned. Secure, 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 yeah. Because uh, in a moment I thought it was the same as secular, but secure, yeah, secular law uh, recognizes this principle. And if somebody does something wrong, it also depends on whether this person, the punishment depends on whether the person wanted to do wrong or whether the person didn't want to do wrong. When it comes to killing, when it comes to killing somebody, this principle is obvious. Whether well, it was an accident that somebody was killed, or whether somebody intentionally killed uh, another person, this uh, person who killed somebody because they wanted to kill that person, well, is worthy of great punishment, deserves to be punished uh, greatly because it was an intentional crime. So we must apply to be truly wise. We must apply knowledge. The knowledge of the divine truth in its own is not sufficient. It is just the beginning, the same as with the fear of the Lord. It is good to feel fear of the Lord, but it is not the goal in itself. It is only the beginning, entrance gate, we could call it, to the road which leads to wisdom. Psalm 111, verse 10, okay, I will quote it from memory. It says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And what is noteworthy is that it doesn't say that the fear of the Lord is wisdom. It is only the beginning of the wisdom, which uh, means that fearing the Lord itself doesn't make you wise. It only makes it possible for you to obtain wisdom. It is a precondition for attaining wisdom. And similarly, the knowledge of God's word is essential to be wise, it is a prerequisite, but in itself it does not suffice, as we also need faith and hope. A person must know and additionally must also trust this knowledge and desire to obtain good results on the basis of this knowledge. Because ultimately faith, which we in the truth literature define as mental appreciation and heart's reliance on God and Christ, but ultimately, faith is putting trust in God and in His Word. And hope is desiring and expecting future good, something good in the future. And the application of these two qualities is necessary to make a person wise. And why faith and hope are indispensable in order to become wise? Because our definition of wisdom says that wisdom is the tactful application of the divine truth. And how could we apply the divine truth in our lives if we didn't trust it? If we didn't desire and expect future good results thanks to it? And does a reasonable person trust information which seems suspicious, not completely true? 
Does any rational person act on dubious information? Would anybody be willing to invest all their wealth in something that they doubt to be true, from which they don't expect to reap any rewards for themselves? And this is what a consecrated child of God must do. On the basis of the knowledge of the divine truth, that is, God's word, a person has to make a decision to consecrate to the Lord, to sell all they have so as to purchase one pearl of great price, as the Bible says, and afterwards make decisions every day that are the fulfillment of their consecration to the Lord. Make decisions that not infrequently are difficult decisions to make, and sometimes from the point of view of worldly wisdom they are strange, foolish, absurd, or unreasonable. But God's word tells them that such conduct is the proper one, and that it is this manner of conduct that is well-pleasing to the Lord, that only this type of conduct is wise from God's standpoint. Victory and a share in God's kingdom can be won with only one move, with one purchase. Every day we must sell everything that we have, so that every day we can purchase this pearl of great price. And of course, this pearl of great price from the parable of our Lord is our participation in God's kingdom. It cannot be one with one decision or with one day spent in communion with the Lord. This pearl of great price must be bought every day until we finish our earthly course. And who would want to act according to such knowledge to let such knowledge guide their actions if they didn't trust it and didn't hope for any future good from it. The future good that we hope to obtain thanks to the divine truth is everlasting life in paradise on earth. Such a person must believe those things that the Bible says and promises, otherwise he or she would be completely irrational. Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. It would mean that we have devoted our lives to fiction, unrealistic dreams, instead of using them to reach our own goals, achieve our own ambitions, and fulfill our own desires. And what would be the result? We have not gained much in this life, and in the future life we would get nothing either. If it were to be so, we would really be the most pitiable people ever. Pitiable or even stupid. That's why, in order to act wisely in life, it doesn't suffice only to know how to act piously. We also need to trust the Bible and hope for future good. And should we lack strong faith and fervent hope, we will not have the strength to, to trust God's word implicitly and act accordingly in our daily lives. Then we will not be wise. We will only be pretending or only acting wisely to some extent and in part which will, will be basing our conduct on our human reason, earthly wisdom, and not on the wisdom from above. So what is wisdom from above like? That's what the apostle tells us in his epistle 317. So let's have a look at its elements so that we can check in what degree we have them and how much they rule our hearts. The, so I read once again James 3.17. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. Uh, I'm quoting from the New King James Version, so, which says peaceable. For example, New International Version says peace-loving. Yeah, but I think that peaceable and peace-loving are synonyms, so no problem. Uh, gentle, willing to wield full of uh, mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So we learn from this scripture that wisdom from above is pure. 
The word pure evokes the idea of innocence, guilelessness, virtue, flawlessness, irreproachability, and genuineness. We can't expect anybody to be actually pure in the full sense of the word, but our Lord gave us the key how to understand this, uh, the meaning of the word when he said, blessed are the pure in heart. You may remember the blessings. So as, as lo because we are imperfect, as long as we are in our mortal imperfect condition, 100% purity is impossible for us. We can only achieve purity in heart, purity of intentions. And wisdom from above is uh, therefore straightforward, sincere, noble and candid. It is honest and does not attempt to convince itself that self-will is God's will. It is pure. It never compromises with sin, impurity in any form or appearance. It is loyal and true to righteousness. Secondly, wisdom from above is peaceable or peace-loving. So it's another quality. First, we must be pure. Then we must be peaceable or peace-loving people. So do we love peace? Have we striven for peace in accordance with what Apostle Paul writes in Hebrews 12, 14, where he says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Have we been trying to do that? If we are looking for this wisdom from above, we can't have a quarrelsome disposition or irritable disposition, but a peace-loving disposition. We should try to live as Apostle Paul recommends in Romans 12, 18 where he says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Sometimes, despite our best efforts, it will not be possible to live in peace with all people. That's why the apostle tells us to live peaceably with all people in as much as it is possible, because sometimes it won't be possible to live in peace with all the people. Sometimes, as you all probably know and have experienced in your lives, it is not possible to live in peace even with the brethren. In spite of the fact that in many instances we may be willing to resign from our preferences and personal likings. However, there is a limit to concessions that we can make when we want to keep peace. There is a line that cannot be crossed when the principles of truth and justice are violated, when error is spread, we cannot sit in silence and pretend that everything is okay. Staying silent in order to keep peace so that the atmosphere remains nice and pleasant is cowardice. It's flight from the battlefield, desertion, or even an act of treason against God and his truth. It is not a wise conduct which the Lord would praise, but it is a stupid conduct that will be reproved by the Lord who said in Jude 1, 3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once uh, delivered to the saints. If we don't protest against error, sectarianism, and clericalism, they will triumph. It has, it has always been so in the history of God's people. That is what happened with the apostolic sowing in the first centuries of the gospel age. And after Brother Russell's death, the Parousia Truth movement met the same fate. After Brother Russell passed away, the majority was of the opinion that they should not oppose the changes that were being introduced then, but that in the interest of peace, they should accept whatever was given to them to believe without examining whether the new teachings were true or scriptural. What has such an attitude resulted in? Well, today, the result is that without batting an eye, they will swallow even the greatest rubbish that is given to them by their channel. Those in the truth movement who do not examine the teachings offered to them, but just accept them 
are going in the same direction. If we neglect the admonitions of the Bible to examine closely all religious teachings and accept only those that meet the demands of the seven axioms of truth and convince us of their biblicality, we will go the same way at the end of which is Babylon, the great one or the smaller ones as the case might be. This is not wise, this is stupid. The peace and quiet which we appreciate so much is not the highest value. Peace as a character grace is only a lower primary grace and as such cannot be a grace which controls our conduct but a grace that itself that is under the control of the higher primary graces. And the higher primary graces are faith, hope, self-control, perseverance, piety, brotherly kindness, and love. Keeping peace above all when the truth is attacked is a violation of the higher primary graces of piety, faith, and love. And in Watchtower Reprint, 2212 or 2212, Brother Russell writes, with the various crooked natures of the world and with our own imperfect dispositions, it will be a difficult matter to avoid all friction. But while in the interest of peace, we are to submit to trifling wrongs and injustices with good grades, yet there is a place where we must draw the line a place where our desire for peace must not control. That is, whenever a principle is involved. Here is a great difficulty. Those who are naturally peaceable will be tempted to pursue peace even at the expense of principle and in conflict with the divine commands. On the other hand, many of those who are firmest in defense of righteous principles are inclined to be combative, and have great need to guard themselves and to cultivate this disposition for peace, which is a part of a divine character which we are to copy. The rule should be first pure, then peaceable. And it is also good to remember that our Lord has not promised us a peaceful life. Although we love peace and quiet and would like to live in peace with everybody, that's not what the Lord has promised us. Our Lord did not assure us that our lives would be easy and pleasant and we will be all giving friendly pats on the shoulder to everybody. Quite to the contrary, in Matthew 10, 34, Jesus says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, for I have come to set a man against his father a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemy will be those of his own household. And Jesus, in his first coming, did not come to bring peace to the world. His second coming is meant to bring peace to the world, but it will take 1,000 years to introduce this peace among men. And uh, Brother Russell in Parousia, volume 6, on page 98, writes uh, that the heavenly wisdom is in harmony with the character of love, which vaunts not itself, is not puffed up, behaves, uh, behaves not itself unseemly, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. There is order in the operation of this wisdom too. For while it takes hold upon all the conditions mentioned by the Apostle James above, there is a difference in the rank it assigns to each. While the spirit of wisdom from above is peaceable, desires peace and seeks to promote it, nevertheless it does not put peace first but purity, first pure, then peaceable. It is earthly wisdom which suggests peace at any price and commands the conscious to be still that selfish peace may be promoted. The wisdom that is pure is simple, is guileless, honorable, open. It loves the light. It is not of darkness, of sin, nor favorable to anything that needs to be hidden. 
It recognizes the hidden works as usually works of darkness, the secret things as usually evil things. It is peaceable so far as would be consistent with honesty and purity. It desires peace, harmony, unity. But since peace is not first, therefore it can only be morally at peace and fully in harmony with those things which are honest, pure, and good. So, as Apostle James says, the wisdom from above is first of all pure. Only then it is peace-loving or peaceable. So it is peaceable as long as it can be peaceable without violating its purity. Because uh, purity first. And thirdly, our verse states that wisdom from above is gentle. It is not unkind, rough, grumpy or boorish, either in speech or in the tone of one's voice. Neither does it sympathize with such spirit of methods. However, the gentleness of wisdom comes only after purity and peaceablenessness. Therefore, those who adopt this wisdom from above are not first of all gentle and peace-loving, and they are not pure because of being gentle, but they are first of all pure, sanctified by the truth and its spirit, and it is because of being pure that they are then gentle and willing to wield. And fourthly, our verse states that wisdom from above is willing to wield. It means that it is, as the old King James Version says, easy to be entreated, approachable. As its name suggests, it is willing to wield, which means it is willing to make concessions, as long as it remains in harmony with purity, peaceablenessness, and gentleness. In matters of little consequence, such as one's own preferences, it does not insist that its preferences should be adopted by others. It does not try to impose them on others. It resigns from what it would prefer without feeling any resentment. However, when it comes to fundamental issues, to matters of principle, it is firm. Principles cannot be bended or altered by men as they belong to God, and they are God-given not to be amended, but to be obeyed. Even though wisdom is firm in keeping to the principles, it shows its moderation by acknowledging every good quality of its opponents, and it always tries to explain why a concession is not possible in matters of the truth, divine law, and principles. It is willing to clarify its position so that others can understand it and learn wisdom too. And fifthly, our verse says that wisdom from above is full of mercy, which means that if we want to practice this heavenly wisdom, we must be very merciful. If we have only a little of mercy in our thoughts, words, and acts, it can be said that we are full of mercy. The more spiritually developed we become, the more mercy we will have, just as God is full of mercy. Our Lord in Matthew 5, 7 says that blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And it's obvious that we must be merciful to be saved, because being imperfect, we need mercy. And in order to obtain mercy, we must be merciful ourselves, as in Matthew 6.15, our Lord adds in the same tone. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So, in other words, if you are not merciful to others, don't count on God being merciful to you. And if God is not merciful to you, you are lost because you need, everybody needs God's mercy. Wisdom from above shows mercy towards the brethren and their faults. It is also merciful in the family. It is not too strict, but instead it is generous and big hearted. It is even magnanimous to its opponents and those who like to quarrel. Even for the sake of the truth, 
it does not strive for a victory at any cost. Being merciful, it does not want the victory of the truth to be harmful, painful, or cruel to the opponents of the truth. Of course, it does contend for the truth and righteousness and wants them to win, but it doesn't want to annihilate its opponents, but it would like to help them to come to a better understanding of wisdom, and it would like to help them adopt the point of view of God's wisdom. Again, a quote from uh, Parousia, volume 6, page 99. But this mercy, while taking hold of the ignorant and unintentional evil doers with sympathy and help, cannot have sympathy or affiliation with willful wrongdoers, because the spirit of wisdom is not first mercy, but first purity. Hence, the mercy of this wisdom can only exercise itself fully toward unintentional or ignorant wrongdoers. And wisdom from above is also full of good fruits, fruits of the Holy Spirit. The more merciful we become, the more of other qualities of the Holy Spirit will we have. And the fruits of the Lord's spirits are sure to grow from the heart in which rules the spirit of love, honesty, purity, peaceablenessness, and gentleness. And sixthly, as his sixth element, wisdom from above is without partiality. Wisdom from above is impartial and unbiased. For it, the most important is not who speaks, but what they say, and how it relates to the divine truth and principles of justice. It loves goodness and truth regardless of where they can be found. And it also opposes untruth, impurity, and ungodliness, regardless of whether they appear in friends or foes. The justice of wisdom is absolute and is moderated only by mercy of which wisdom is full. There is no cronism in the wisdom from above, which means there is no supporting of one another just because we are good friends in order to gain some benefits, usually obtained in a dishonest way or in order to protect an evildoer, just because this person is dear to your heart. The impartiality of the wisdom from above enables its possessor not only to praise a fault, it enables it not to praise a fault in a friend or brother, just because he is a friend or a brother, but it reproves him with the same gentleness and meekness, remembering that we are all subject to temptations from the world, the flesh, and Satan. Wisdom from above, even in an enemy, can discern virtues and will not hesitate to acknowledge them. The principle of wisdom is truth and not prejudice, bias, or sectarianism. Wisdom does not think that only we are good, and all others who hold different views are bad or evil. Because uh, some people behave as, 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 as if only, and those who believe similarly are the good ones. And uh, they say, why are we? Why? And uh, they say, why are, to the question, why are we good? They answer, because uh, we are we. And be why are the others bad? because they are not us. And since we are good, others must be bad. That's not what wisdom from above thinks. Brother Russell writes again, the heavenly wisdom is declared to be without partiality. Partiality would imply injustice. And the purity and peace and gentleness and mercy and the good fruits of the spirit of wisdom from above lead us not, uh, to be no longer respecters of persons, except as character demonstrates their real value. The outward features of the natural man, the color of the skin, and so on, are ignored by the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom which comes from above. It is impartial and desires that which is pure, peaceable, gentle, true, wherever found and under whatever circumstances it is exhibited. So it is without 
partiality. And it's uh, good to remember about this uh, principle because uh, people tend to be partial towards those other people whom they love and uh, find it difficult to acknowledge anything that is good in somebody whom they don't like. And it is simply impossible that some people are good and others are bad because we are all a mixture of good qualities and of bad qualities. So even if somebody is our opponent, this somebody whom we don't uh, like, this person must have some good qualities. This person cannot be completely devoid of good uh, qualities. And if you are impartial without prejudice, you will be able to acknowledge it. It's part of being wisdom. And uh, if you look especially at politicians, they seem to be devoid of this quality of wisdom at all, because all their political opponents are wrong and they are the only people right and only they can do good. All the others, whatever they do, it is always wrong and only they would uh, could could do something good. They seem to uh, try to be trying to convey such a message, uh, such a message. If you elect us and we are in government, well, we will save the world, which is not true uh, at all we they will do some things right and some things wrong just as their predecessors did some things wrong some things right uh, and finally seventhly wisdom from above is said to be without hypocrisy it is completely sincere and doesn't need to pretend love as it is love it doesn't have to make an impression of possessing good fruits of the spirit as it is full of them. It is bursting with good acts and words. It overflows with them. It doesn't have to take on appearances of goodness because it is without malice and quarrelsomeness. It doesn't need to hide anything as it has nothing to hide. And uh, again, a quotation from uh, Parousia volume six, this wisdom from above is furthermore without hypocrisy. It is so pure, so peaceable, so gentle, so merciful toward all that there is no necessity for hypocrisy where it is in control. But it is bound to be out of harmony, out of sympathy, out of fellowship with all that is sinful because it is in fellowship, in sympathy with all that is pure, or that is uh, making for purity, peace and gentleness. And under such condition, there is no room for hypocrisy. So that's the last element of uh, this wisdom from above, which in Apostle James's words is first of all pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to wield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And we should all try to be like that. First of all, pure, then peace-loving, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, and then without partiality and without hypocrisy. And uh, I would like to ask God to help us be like that, to acquire as much of the wisdom from above as it is humanly possible for us so that we could act wisely and let us remember that it is not enough to know we must put our knowledge into practice because as brother johnson writes uh, true wisdom is the application of the principles of the divine truth in our daily lives knowledge itself does not save anybody it is only knowledge that is applied in our lives that it is helpful that will make us wise and i wish you all this wisdom which is also my desire to learn more and more about this wisdom may the lord add his blessing to these thoughts thank you for your attention